Good morning, Church One. It is great to be with you again on this beautiful fall weekend. Um, as always, love to invite you to uh, be with us in person when you can and are able. Uh, we are at 6200 North Charles Street in Towson, and we meet Sunday mornings at 1015. But it's good to be with you in this way, and I hope God is with you on this Sunday. Um, we have been in the book of James for the month of September. James was Jesus's half-brother and uh, was the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem after Jesus's ascension. And uh, the book of James has a certain uh, kind of vibe to it, a certain character of uh, James's personality. James must have been a straight shooter uh, and he had this sort of capacity as a leader. And as he was thinking of the, the Jewish Christian communities that he was leading, I think he had the capacity to say what needed to be said. Um, and you pick that up as you're in this passage. There's a lot of directness and a lot of talking to uh, issues that would have been dividing the community. Sarah, a few weeks ago, talked about uh, the favoritism that was existing in the community between the rich and the poor, and James called that out. Last week, Lori talked about the power of words and how words can create uh, all this conflict and make community really difficult. And uh, this week, uh, James is kind of broaching another issue, which is how do you tell the real deal in your teachers and your leaders? What are the signs uh, that your leaders and teachers are rooted and solid, and what are the signs that they aren't? Uh, remember, James was the leader of the church uh, in Jerusalem, and uh, Christianity had sort of brought on a new platform. If you think about religious leadership, uh, it used to follow the way of rabbis and school leaders and all that stuff, uh, and here Christ Jesus comes along, and he leads, uh, by their own definition, in, uh, in the book of Acts, a bunch of unschooled and ordinary men. And these men become the leaders of a new movement called Christianity, showing that it was possible to speak for God uh, without all this training and all this other stuff. And that is a really good thing and was a really good thing. But uh, like all good things, there is a shadow side, and the sense was without sort of these uh, places to kind of vet leaders, um, all sorts of leaders could pop up and be claiming to speak for God and telling people what to do and what to think, and it was hard to vet. And so James is sort of uh, broaching this issue uh, with his listeners and saying, you've got to be able to learn how to discern who a wise leader and teacher is and who isn't. It's gonna be up to you to answer the question who is wise? Who do you listen to? And that is a vitally important question for any community to answer. Uh, back then, it would have been important, but it's important for us as well. Um, we have to continue to ask these questions. And so what I want to do is read this passage. Um, just a little backdrop, the beginning of James 3. James asks the question, you know, like, or makes the statement, not many of you should want to be teachers, right? that teaching and leading is a serious thing. And then he goes on to describe, like Lori took us last week, the power of words. And, and then he, we get to this chunk, it's starting in James uh, chapter 3, verse 13, where he begins to lay out the, how do we discern who is wise and who we should listen to. As I read it, we're going to look at two things. Uh, we're going to look at what, what is it that James is saying? And then secondly, what does it mean for us? So let me read it and then we'll pray. James 3, starting in verse 13, um, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Update Edition. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, 
full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot, cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, uh, the question is, who is wise and discerning? And I certainly know that innate inside of me, uh, I do not have the capacity of wisdom and discerning. It is only by your gospel and your spirit um, that we can hear your wisdom. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak through this, that you would help us to hear your wisdom, that we would, may, might discover what is peaceable and pure and good and true, and that that may be a guide for us, Lord. May you help us, Lord, discern the voices in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're looking at two questions. Uh, first, what, what exactly is James saying here? Like I said, he's a straight shooter and he's talking to a direct issue. And uh, we, we need to kind of understand that. And he, he starts with a question and he gives us an immediate answer. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? That's the question. Like, who do you listen to? Who is the wise one? And he says, show it by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born out of wisdom. James' answer is, you want to know who's wise? Don't listen to their words. Look at their life. Because it, is, because it is their life that proves their words. That's what he says. I, 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 put, up a, I put together a little slide that I think uh, will illustrate kind of th how James like, goes on to answer this question. And basically, James says that there are, are I, I have on the slide, two different paths, right? Um, the, path, the one path uh, leads, it, it flows, uh, who is wise, uh, comes out of a closed system. James describes uh, the wisdom uh, that is earthly and unspiritual, devilish. Um, it's not that James is against, I don't think, common sense and, you know, figuring basic things out like how to build a house that you need to you know, go to the scriptures to find that. I don't think he's talking like that, but he's saying that the ultimate source of the kind, one kind of wisdom is that it comes from a closed system. What do I mean by that? I think what I mean is uh, James is saying there are people that believe ultimate reality is closed, that there is a limited supply of whatever it is that we want, and it is up to us to fight to get it, maybe to manipulate, to lie, to be more powerful than, to align ourselves with powerful force, whatever it is, there's a limited supply of what we need and it is up to us to fight to get it. Economists have a phrase um, that they use to describe this kind of thinking. It's called zero-sum thinking. Zero-sum thinking just basically means if the total gains of the participants are added up and the total la losses of other participants are subtracted, the sum will be zero. Think about like cutting a cake, right? If I give you a huge piece of the cake, that means everybody else has to get a little smaller piece of the cake. There is a limited supply and the zero sum, right, means that the gains and losses add up to zero. For everybody's gain, someone else is losing. Uh, as they said in Talladega Nights, right? Second place is just first loser, right? There's only winners and losers, those that have and those that have it taken from. And that this is a closed system. This is what life looks like in a closed system. And it, the history is littered, right? with the result of this kind of wisdom. Think of all the wars, all the blood that has been spilled on this basic assumption that there's either winners or losers and you don't wanna be on the losing side. And it makes sense in a way, 
um, in, a, in, in an earthly way, right? There may be limited supplies of some things um, and that it makes sense to, to, to kind of think that way. And, and, and uh, the, the world sort of reinforces that a lot, um, you know? And if you're living in a closed system, being aggressive, uh, being zealous is one of the words that uh, James uses, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Machiavelli, right, the famous book, The Prince, was really an exposition in the, in the Middle Ages of this kind of thinking. You know, like, you can have all the lofty ideas you want, Machiavelli said, but life is a closed system and you better learn to fight for what is yours. He has the famous question, is it better for a leader to be feared or loved? And he would say, feared, that that's better, right? And, um, and, and there, again, that <laughs> makes a lot of worldly sense. It really does. And that's one of the reasons why the closed system um, kind of seems to be a source of wisdom. Uh, but what you need to pay attention to is the result, right? Uh, what is the result of this kind of wisdom? James says, envy, selfish ambition, disorder, wickedness of every kind, right? Um, losing, uh, if you think this way, that life is closed and the system is closed, then losing becomes impossible. But the problem is we're all going to lose eventually. Uh, as I was, uh, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about for a while we watched uh, the show Narcos, right? This story of these uh, drug kingpins in Mexico and other places. And, uh, you know, one of the things that became apparent is that there were no end games for these drug kingpins. Either they're going to be caught and put in jail for life or they're going to get murdered uh, by their competition. But none of them end well. Even if in the middle of their lives they seem to have power and money and pleasure and all that kind of stuff, there's always this looming end game for all of them that it cannot, it will not end well for them. That is like, I know that none of you... Most of you listening to this probably aren't pondering a life as a drug kingpin. But in a way, that is sort of the ultimate example of life in a closed system. That the only answer is to fight for what you can get and hold on to it for as long as you can because it's a zero-sum game and eventually you're going to lose. It's interesting to consider, like, again, maybe you're not that extreme, but how much does jealousy drive you? James says that you can tell the fruit of this stuff when jealousy and selfish ambition, it's not that ambition's wrong, but selfish ambition is really driving you. Uh, Will Reagan, the comedian, had a great, a, a funny example of that when he has the skit about the me monster, that, you know, the kind of person that you meet in a party that uh, turns every conversation back to them and about them and all of that, you know, and, and we, we all turns into often me monsters when we get in this closed system of thinking. Um, and so um, that's what one path, right, James says, and you can, you can tell the, the, the source of the wisdom by the fruit of the life, and the fruit of the life of the closed system is envy and chaos and disorder. James says there's another source, and we can maybe put the slide back up for a second, there's another source, right? And that is wisdom that comes from above, right? Those words above are really interesting when you consider them. He's but basically to say that something comes in from above is toward to say that there is something else infusing the system. It's not a closed system. It's not a it's not a cake. It's a it's a it's something that is it, there's a constant infusion of something new. There's a constant refilling and that life actually isn't a zero-sum game. There may be uh, limited supplies of certain things in the world, but not the things that really matter, right? So take love, for example. Um, I'm not the perfect parent, for sure, um, but I know this, that my love for my kids isn't like a cake. Uh, I don't give some kids a bigger cake bigger piece and other kids smaller pieces they don't actually possess a limited supply of love for my kids uh, I, my love for my kids can't be divided 
sometime, somehow 100 divided by 4 equals 100, right? When it comes to my love, it doesn't equal 25. It equals 100. Because there's something about love that isn't divisive like that, right? It, 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 it's not a zero-sum thing. It in, it, something is infusing us. And, and James says the fruit of, you see the fruit of this kind of looking at life, ultimate life, not as a closed system, produces a whole different kind of fruit. He lists these things, pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. It's interesting. James, I don't think, is saying like, this is like the complete list of this kind of stuff. It's actually in Greek and alliteration, like, a um, bunch of them have the long A, start with the long A, and then the rest start with the long E sound. So he's just sort of alliterating and listing a bunch of characteristics. But, but what he is showing you is that when you're peaceful, you're gentle, you're willing to yield, right? You're full of mercy and good fruits. You're not partial, hypocritical. What kind of thinking does that require? When you're that way, when you're behaving that way with stuff, what is the thinking? Here's what I'd say. It's when you feel like there's plenty to go around. When there's plenty to go around, you're not fighting. You're, well, oh, yeah, go ahead. You take it. I'll, I'll just get the next one. You know, I, 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 I can be at peace. I don't have to strive. Um, I'm, I'll trust that it'll come. When I believe there's plenty of what re I really need to go around, I don't fight the world. I don't fight. And that's what James is saying. You can see the source. So if you have a source of wisdom that says, ultimately life is open from above, God can give you what you need, the fruit of that kind of thinking shows up in the way that you live your life. So that's what I think James is saying. I hope that slide and those thoughts were helpful. Let me kind of bring this down to earth a little bit and just talk about what does it mean for us. Um, you know, remember what I said that the church is painted this picture of a of a new platform, right? Uh, new leaders were emerging. It was hard to discern, like what voice was wise, what voice wasn't, what voice should I listen to? And that new platform uh, required the question: Okay, who do I listen to? And whenever there's new platforms for messages, uh, not that the messages change, but a new platform changes how you receive the message. Uh, there were new teachers in the church that they had to figure out. Uh, we, we have new platforms. Um, Jesse Norton sent me a great article uh, earlier la last week uh, about how we don't even know how to be bored anymore. We really don't. Because we now, um, if we're in line, what do we do? We pull this thing out. And we look and we scroll. If we're walking, uh, what do we do? We have our AirPods on. We're listening to a podcast, or you know, if we're if if we're driving in the car, you know, in, check my Instagram feeds. All this kind of stuff. Um, we don't even really know how to be bored anymore because we are now permanently connected through our phones to a platform of teachers and people telling you what life is supposedly all about, right? And um, it's a constant, constant battle. And so um, you have to decide, like, what voices am I going to listen to? What voices? Um, and I would say, just like James, uh, the question you need to ask yourself is pay attention to the fruit, right? When you're done scrolling, when you're done that podcast, when you're done... Um, you know, checking out all of these feeds, is your life full of more envy and worry and zeal, you know, like selfish ambition? Or is your life full of peace, patience, kindness? Okay, it's not that it, it, the platform is what it is. It's here. It's a reality. Just like the church, that was a new reality. You have to be discerning. What's happening to you? What is the fruit of the wisdom that you are receiving, right? Um, and, and, and I think that that, you know, that's kind of what this last part of the passage shows. It shows kind of uh, what this battle looks like. He says there, those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? 
Well, they come from your envy, your desire. They, they come from your belief that you're in a closed system and you have to fight and kill and get what you need, right? That's, that's what's showing up in your life. And where is it coming from? It's coming from the wisdom that you're taking in. It's coming from your beliefs. Do you live in an open or a closed system? What I appreciate about this passage is, is this was going on in the church. Um, this was going on in the lives of individual believers. I, I am that slide I showed you. Sometimes I veer to the left and listen to the closed system. Sometimes I, I veer to the right and listen to the open system. And you can tell which one I'm primarily listening to by the fruit in my life, right? And that's true of me, and I think it's true of you as well. You know, I, I, think, I think about uh, what James is saying when he, you know, what, how, do you, how do you think of life, right? Like, do you have to fight for it, or is it a gift? Uh, you know, I often, life, like the wisdom of this world, teaches me I got to fight for it. But then when I think about my life, I realize every good thing I have really was a gift. You know, I didn't win in in a fight. I mean, there was another guy, but that's another story I don't want to talk about. But, you know, like, and in the end was a gift, was a gift to me. And if I think any differently, um, I miss out on the love and joy. How do you get a gift? Like, that's what James is talking about. Like, you're fighting and all you got to do is ask. You get gifts, he says, not by fighting in a closed system, but by living in an open system and learning to ask God for it. Learning to ask. Um, if you end your life feeling like you won a battle, you're not going to end your life well. If you end your life believing you've been given a gift, the fruit of that will show up in the peace and the kindness and the goodness of your life, right? And that's what James is saying. And I love what he says, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who makes peace. You know, this, this word peace would have been such a rich word. Uh, James, again, is coming from a Jewish context. This is that word shalom. Uh, peace is not just the absence of conflict. It means nothing missing, nothing broken. Uh, it, it means every kind of good thing. So the, so the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, those who kind of make every kind of good thing, right? Who are about living in an open system, knowing that they get these gifts from God and living that way wisely, right? Live life well. I was uh, thinking this uh, this week, I've been paying attention to people that I listen to that uh, seem like they live in an open system. And I was in a, a course I take called Faith Walking, and I was listening to a woman talk who uh, grew up in a large dysfunctional family uh, that she spent a lot of her life running from. And lately she's tried to stop running and, uh, and, and asking kind of how she's making this change. She just very simply said, I have to accept and believe that God loves me. And it is her learning to accept and believe that that is helping her make shalom with her past. That's the wisdom, right, that comes from above. It's, it's interesting to consider, like, to be a Christian means not only to believe in Jesus, it means to believe what Jesus believed. Uh, Jesus n knew God not as some abstract force uh, that could help him win, win or a fate that helped him lose. Jesus knew God as his Father, right? That's what he knew him as. So when the world was kind of closing in on him, right, when the worldly powers were nailing Jesus to a cross, and when his life was ebbing away from him, he, he turned to God on the cross and he said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. In the midst of this closed system of the world that is seeking to crush me, Jesus says, I see an opening. I see something bigger, something greater that I can entrust my spirit to in the midst of this brokenness. And it is at that moment that Jesus once and for all 
declared a victory for the open systems of the world and the way of wisdom that can live even in the midst of great suffering and great persecution and great, great trial that was able to see even in the midst of that, that there is an openness because of this loving heavenly father who is wise. Look at the fruit of their lives. Jesus offers us a different kind of wisdom, not one that operates out of a closed system, but one that lives with an openness to the love of the Heavenly Father. Let me just close with a few questions for you. Um, what are your sources of wisdom? Who is wise? Who is discerning? How would you actually know? Look at their lives. By the way, this makes a subtle case for saying you can't chase all your wisdom down <laughs> from books and podcasts and YouTube presentations and classes. Those are good, but incarnational reality, when you get to look at the lives of people that are giving you wisdom and see them in other contexts beyond just teaching and spouting off things, matters a lot. So showing up at church, being a part of a faith community actually helps you, right, discern true wisdom. Do you want to open yourself up to God's love, right? Do you believe it? Again, I, I often take the left or the right path. I, I get caught up in the closed systems of this world. I need to remind myself, do I believe in the openness of God? Would you want to open yourself up right now? What, what helps you open yourself up? What are the spiritual practices, right, that you can do? Prayer, um, listening to a friend, worship, you know, what are taking being alone in solitude with God, um, being a part of a Christian community where you're serving and all that? You know, do these things open you up to the love of God and give you a different source of wisdom in the midst of your challenges? And lastly, I'd say, is there a circumstance in your life right now that requires wisdom? Is there something you're wrestling with? Is there something you're struggling with? Is your thinking open or closed? What would it look like to think open right in the midst of this? These are tough questions to answer. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to figure it out. I, I can't tell you all the answers. But I think James, uh, again, had a, had a penchant for saying what needed to be said. And in the midst of a chaotic world with lots and lots of voices, he answer, asked and answered a simple question. Who is wise among you? Who is it? Your ability to answer that question will guide your life. Let's pray. Lord, uh, James says if we lack wisdom to ask for it. And so I just pray that you would give us the wisdom we need uh, in the, these moments of our lives. Help open our hearts to your love, to your reality. Guide us in your truth for your sake and for your glory. Amen. God bless you, Church One. May God give you the wisdom you need this week. Thanks. Thanks.